Hey everybody, this is Townsend. I'm a singer, songwriter, musician, and mental health advocate, and I started the You're Not Alone project and podcast to help educate, spread awareness, and simply help you feel a little less alone, no matter what you're going through. Thank you so much for tuning in to Season 2 of You're Not Alone with Townsend. Be sure to click the follow button and share these stories. You can also watch the interviews on our YouTube under Townsend T Music. You can also keep up with the journey if you follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Townsend T Music. Every like, follow, and share helps us continue to change lives. I'm beyond excited to announce that I'm releasing a new music project. 2018 was the last time I released a full project, so I'm nervous, I'm excited, and I'm ready to bring you some new music. I collaborated with some of the world's best musicians and a multi-Grammy winning producer to make these songs the very best they could be. They're recorded, perfected, and in the vault just waiting to be released. Here's where you come in. So the recording process is done, but I need your help with the releasing process. Distribution, merch, design, video, marketing, all of those things are not cheap. As a matter of fact, we were trying to add up how much we've spent so far in this process, and we stopped counting at $13,000. Ugh. So for the first time, I'm doing a Kickstarter. I've had so many people wanting to be part of the process, and here's your chance. This gives my supporters a chance to help out, but the best part is you get amazing exclusive offers just for helping out. The team and I sat down and put a lot of thought into these rewards. We have things like phone memos of the songs, exclusive video and audio tracks, songs that didn't quite make the cut, and we even have private acoustic house parties where I can play for you. Every person that helps will get first access to the hit song Let's Sneak Out before it's released publicly. It's gonna be amazing but we need your help. We have 30 days to meet this goal. If it's not met, we get nothing, not us. So donate, share, and please, let's make this happen. What is up, everybody? It is Townsend. Thank you so much for tuning in to You're Not Alone with Townsend. Today, I'm really excited. So I've got a guy on here named Justin Fields, and we're going to be talking about DBS or deep brain stimulation, which excites me like none other, but I'm also a total dweeb. Um, so I'm excited to pick your brain, Justin, and I hope you're ready for all the crazy questions that I have. That's all I could say. This, this is incredibly exciting for me, probably a little less so for you, but yeah. So thank you for uh, joining us. Oh, no, thank you for having me on. Um, you're, you're completely wrong on that. Anytime I can actually like go through and the, like the understanding and the logistics behind um, deep brain stimulation and how it helps people with young onset Parkinson's as well as those with traditional onset. I'm here for it. I love every yes. second of it. It is so cool. I love how far technology has come. I love the brain. I love anything that makes people feel less alone, obviously, mental health wise. So it all just comes together in your case and just watching the amazing things that you do on social media and just following your story has been really cool. So I feel like Thank we you. should include the listeners on what the heck we're talking about. Don't you think? Oh, yeah. So, They'd be um, really lost. OK, so yeah, let's hop yeah, in. So. so so who the heck is Justin? So what is your job? What is your age? Do you have any kids? Where are you looking? Anything you want to share with us? I want to personally thank you for taking the time to listen to these conversations. It truly means so much. We've changed so many lives for the better, and we want to continue doing so throughout 2023. This project is made possible by sponsors and patrons. So if you'd like to help keep the You're Not Alone project going and hearing these amazing stories, we would love for you to join the family at patreon.com slash Townsend T Music. Just for signing up, you'll get free merch, discounts, and behind-the-scenes patron-only footage, not only of my music, but of each episode. That's right, so each guest on every episode answers a few more questions that only patrons will be able to watch and listen to. So head on over to patreon.com 
slash Townsend Team Music. And let's continue changing lives. Yeah, I'm, um, you know, just your average guy from Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, no kids, uh, no wife. I'm single, recently divorced. Um, well, a couple years ago, so we don't count that anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Proud, proud cat dad of two very fat cats and a younger one that is not fat yet. Not yet. Um, it's on its way. Yeah, not, not yet. She's She's got a couple more years before she catches up with the other ones. Um, so, yeah, I try to do as much as I can on social media to help raise awareness for um, Parkinson's disease in general. I've worked with the Michael J. Fox Foundation for the past few years, just volunteering my time services to try to raise money and awareness. And at one point, I was on the National Parkinson's Foundation uh, People with Parkinson's Advisory uh, Council. Wow. So um, we focus very heavily on ways to reach out to individuals um, that might not be so willing to come forward uh, with their diagnosis. And it's kind of very similar to your podcast, like just let people know they're not alone um, in this entire process. So um, a couple of years ago, I was, well, back in 2016, I was diagnosed with uh Parkinson's disease, completely out of the blue, had no idea it was coming. Um, I got diagnosed with a couple other things first, such as um, epilepsy, um, essential tremor, and then I took the medication and the treatment for that, and it actually made me so much worse. I actually developed um, seizures from the epilepsy medicine, so that was fun. Wow. Um, so, yeah, 2016 came around, stunned me. I was super, super mad for a long time, but eventually I was like, well, I'm going to turn this anger into something positive, and here I am today, um, still plugging away and you know, doing great. Wow. You absolutely look like you're doing great. So what, how old were you when you got diagnosed? I was 31 years old. Oh, so two, my two gosh. Years older, two years older than Michael J. Fox, but uh, we're not counting. Wow. <laughs> 31 years old. So you got diagnosed with Parkinson's at 31 years old and you had those like signs and symptoms before, like, were you yeah. having what what made them diagnose you with those two random things first? What kind of signs were you um, having? Well, I, I was having whenever you're going through the uh, the entire process of getting diagnosed, there's a, a lot of things that they look at. Um, some of them are more in line with, you know, traditional onset versus young onset. So you're looking for a tremor. You're looking for sleep disturbances. You're looking for um, dyskinesia, any type of dystonia. Like, do you have the the swing in your arm like is that lesson do you have a gait whenever you walk like any particular like it's one of your legs dragging um so they're looking at all of that but for me in particular uh i was sitting in my office typing away i was doing a lot of paperwork at the time and all of a sudden my left hand just started you know tapping pretty aggressively on the keyboard and i'm like well somebody doesn't want to work today <laughs> so i took a video of it and it happened a couple more times and i took the videos to my doctor and i'm like Look, I think I'm getting I think I'm getting the stress that I've heard so much about. Like, you know, adults get stressed out. I, I think I'm getting the stress. I think I know what this is now. And I showed him the video and he's like, yeah, that's not stress. Um, so that that started me on my process of trying to find a neurologist that would uh, do the proper testing, trying to find one that, you know, would eventually help me find the answers. And that's kind of how I got started on that. But if you look back, um, I would say my first symptom was probably the issue with sleep that I was having some pretty severe insomnia, just couldn't get my brain to turn off. And I'd had that for about five years. Wow. So it's, I believe I was symptomatic probably toward 25, 26 years old. Oh, goodness gracious. Absolutely. Sleep is so crucial. And I think people forget about that. You know, we're all yeah. staying up on social media all night. No, I didn't sleep very good. I tossed and turned, but they're finding how important good rest is. It basically, the easiest way to word it, they've, they've worded it in layman terms, but it's like your body dumps all its trash when you're in a good deep sleep. And so if you don't yep. allow your body in that, it just kind of like stores all the trash for a really long time. That is why 31, like, I'm still just thinking, holy moly, that is so young. I had a, I had a gentleman on here not too long ago that talked about his Parkinson's diagnosis and it came out of the blue as well. He was working full time and his first symptom was when he would get really stressed, his pinky would tremor, just one pinky. And he said, so I'd put it in my pocket when I was stressed and just totally ignore it. But it's, yeah, it's kind of similar. Yeah, you get used to it. Like there's ways that you could like get around it. Like um, 
I would be stressed driving to work. I mean, who's not stressed driving to work yeah. as opposed to driving the home? Worst. So I would just like my hand would start shaking and I would just sit on it. Like I would just stick it right under my butt and sit on it in the car and yeah. just ride it out until I got there. Yeah, just ride it out. It Literally just riding your hand. I, I'm not going to lie. So I'm pretty stubborn and I hear people on these podcasts. I'm like, good for you for going to the doctor. You should get things checked out, but I'm not going to lie. If my pinky tremored or my hand shook, I would not go to the doctor for that. Like, I'm just going to be totally well, transparent. Well, I mean, now, now after, and I, I encourage you and all your viewers, if you haven't watched it yet to go watch the uh, TV show, Sweet Tooth. Okay. Um, it's, it's on Netflix and I, I just equated so much of it back to Parkinson's disease because one of the symptoms before they get the sick or whenever they get the sick is what they call it, is their pinky starts to tremor and then eventually they get worse. And um, I don't want to give away like too much, yeah. but I, like hearing you say that, I'm like, oh, I've got to go watch Sweet Tooth. I'm on I've, episode go, I've never heard of it. I'm going to have to go check it out it's, now. It's a super, super cute story. So you're going to yeah. have to watch it. I might have to go check it out for sure. Okay. So did you have... You know, you said that it hit you like totally out of the blue. Did you even know what Parkinson's was? Like, oh yeah, I mean, I mean, I knew about like the Michael J. Fox stuff, yeah. of course. Everybody knows about that. Um, but I didn't, I didn't fully understand a lot of the other symptoms that were associated with it. Like, I knew it was a movement disorder. I knew that there was shaking involved, but I had no no idea the level of like the differences in shaking like right. you know there's a difference between a tremor and dyskinesia there's a difference between dyskinesia and dystonia like how many movement things can you throw into one you know one bucket and just give it to a person um but the things that i wasn't aware of was like the just the neurological aspect of it like not only is your brain not getting um the signals out to your body that's where the movement issues come into but it's also not really getting the signals for you to shut your brain off to go to sleep. Um, there's a higher level of depression and anxiety with people that have Parkinson's disease. That's also in the play. Uh, people have more uh, issues with Parkinson's disease. So there's, there's just a lot to it. Um, so I try to, you know, take all that into consideration whenever I'm just thinking like full scope of how everything's going. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's go from there for people that don't know what is Parkinson's? You kind of just explained it. Basically, your body's not helping initiate or letting those signals go through. But is that how you would define Parkinson's? Um, yeah, yeah. It's Parkinson's disease. It's really it's a neurodegenerative disease. Um, they're very, very close to finding out what actually causes it. And that's the reason I'm always so gung ho about um, making sure people have the awareness and they're donating to the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Um, because it, it saved my life, you know, very easily. And we'll get into that, you know, a little bit later, but, um, it's a neurodegenerative disease that a lot of the protein that is getting built up in your brain is blocking dopamine that is getting released into, you know, all of the signals of your body. So really it just has to do with, uh, dopamine blockage and trying to make sure you're getting that artificial dopamine put back into your system, which is the reason you have your medications such as your uh, carbidopa levodopa, and then you have some dopamine agonists that aren't as severe but don't work as well. And that also kind of uh, keys into the deep brain stimulation as well. As they're all different ways of trying to get this artificial dopamine back into your brain. That way, it can get sick, sent out to the rest of your body, and you can operate as normally as possible. Man, crazy, crazy. So something that the guy on my last podcast that talked about Parkinson said, and it really stuck with me. I'd love to hear your input on this. He talked about how Parkinson's itself stops your movement pretty much, makes it irregular. But the medicine yeah. tries to, you know, make it a little bit more normal, a little more uh, relaxed, help you initiate it. But then once your body becomes immune to it, uh, that's when the huge shaking and overcompensating, like those big movements that you see people like Michael J. Fox do. True or false? Yeah, uh, that is true. Um, while that that typically happens with the carbidopa, levodopa med medication. Um, so you're, you're taking this medicine that alleviates your tremor. And of course, that helps, you know, from a young onset standpoint, that helps you, you know, be able to function in a normal capacity for a lot longer. Right. Um, so on the surface, you're like, yeah, that sounds great. Like medication, you know, it stops it. Um, but what they've discovered over the past 20 to 30 years is the carbidopa, levodopa medication specifically 
is what's causing the dystonesia, which is the uncontrollable movements that come on later uh, with the later onset in Parkinson's disease once the efficacy of the medication wears off. So that's the reason they're kind of trying to get people to take more dopamine agonists before they start taking the carbidopa levodopa up front. So yeah, what what you see with Michael J. Fox and a lot of his um, rhythmic movements where he's you know kind of bouncing around doesn't really seem to have any symmetry to it. That's actually a side effect of the medication that he's been taking for you know twenty to twenty to thirty years, just trying to you know keep his tremor at bay, and it's just part of the game. Like you have a medication that helps you temporarily, and then you've got to you know kind of work off that. Yeah, and I think that can go with anything in life. You know, you take a medicine for this, but it's got a side effect, and then you take a medicine for the side effect, and it's just mm-hmm. like a monopoly game, just crazy, crazy. So you recently went through something called deep brain stimulation, which we talked about earlier. Now, yes. what the heck is that? Explain that in layman terms for people that are listening. Okay, so deep brain stimulation, they basically take, um, it's kind of like a brain pacemaker. Um, I think that's the easiest way to associate it with uh, the general public is um, everybody knows that whenever you have a pacemaker, you have a device in your chest that helps you know regulate um, certain aspects of your heart, except my pacemaker, so to speak, my deep brain stimulator pack, which is located right here, has wires that run up into my skull. They drilled holes into my head, um, put leads in, and I basically can control the artificial the artificial dopamine level that is currently going through my brain. So um, I have a little radio pack that I decided to bring along with me. Yeah. And basically you just set it around your neck, make sure it's sitting on top of your battery and you can go through and adjust settings. However, yeah, I see popped up. Yeah. Yeah. You can adjust settings and for a little demonstration, you can even turn it off. Um, so as you could tell, like I was relatively normal, but it, after, you know, having it off for a couple seconds, the the tremors start back. Um, I have a lot of trouble, you know, trying to articulate things because the rhythm's not there anymore. Um, and my legs are bouncing up and down right now. So I'm just going to, you know, turn it back on, but, um, you just kind of get, get used to having that aspect of it. So yeah, that's it turns back on please thank you yeah please hurry up (laughs) that is wild I love that so much okay so I got a couple questions for you (laughs) yeah back to normal okay so for the people that are just listening not watching the video basically had a battery pack wrapped it around him when he turned the button off he got a little bit of a tremor back in his hand was having a little bit more trouble communicating legs were kind of jumping around and then you turn it back on and it's back to normal just like you and I function for people that couldn't see that to me I think that is nothing short of miraculous like that is it, such a cool device it really is and apparently my cat noticed that I was doing it so oh, he reached up he's like are you okay yeah I am I um, like, calm down yeah. dad calm down it's it was a very stressful surgery not gonna lie because you have to be awake yeah. while they're doing it so um they give you enough medication to make you comfortable. I say they give you enough medication to make you compliant because yeah. I remember the whole thing. Um, and you get, you got to work through that, but I would swear up and down if anybody is eligible to have deep brain stimulation surgery, it's a much better option because you're able to delay the medication. Um, hopefully you're able to de- delay it completely until the efficacy of the deep brain stimulation wears off or you can take a lesser quantity of medication. That's the reason I got it because I hated how the medication made me feel. I gained close to a hundred pounds and I was just like, "Ah, this, this isn't for me. I want to be healthy. I had a very progressive doctor at Vanderbilt university and he was like, I think you're a candidate for this. Let's see what we can do. And the rest is history after that. Wow. Okay. So they basically give you a numbing on your head cut mm-hmm. you open you're you're totally awake but do they keep you awake so that they can see kind of what's happening like they can touch parts of your brain and see if the tremor stops yeah yeah Ooh, um, that's, that's crazy that was, that was the one thing that was uh pretty cool about it um if you want to say cool uh yeah <laughs> like I was kind of worried that they would like poke something and just make me start like barking like a dog but they never did they were very professional very oh, professional good. so uh I'll give them kudos to that but there was this 
there was this moment whenever I was in surgery and it's still like, I can still feel it to this day. It was that impactful in my life. Um, whenever they hit the right level that they were supposed to hit, because there's like a bunch of different um, leads on each side of my brain. And they basically just kind of go through, test it out. And whenever they hit the right one, it was like every muscle in my body just released. And I'm like, so this is, this is how I should have been feeling for the past 10 years. And it was just so insane. Um, the, the tremor immediately stopped. Like I had a lot more clarity in my brain. Like it was just like a release and I'll never, I'll never forget having that feeling for the first time. Like it was just insane. It was worth being awake while people were poking at your brain. Yeah. 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 It was worth and like hearing all the chips go up against the back of the back of the, uh, the sheet. Yeah. Yeah. No big deal. No big deal. Just chipping away at your brain. No big deal. Yeah. Um, I, so a long time ago, like I said, I'm a total dweeb. I think the brain is incredibly remarkable. And I watched a video about this. This was way long ago when it first came out. And this guy was playing a violin and he couldn't even hold the bow. You know, he's just like going crazy and they're poking around on his brain. And just like that, they hit that perfect spot and he plays the most perfect song on his violin. And it's a, an incredibly emotional video because the doctors are thinking, we got it. The patient is awake. He can finally play violin again. It was incredible to watch. So I imagine yours was kind of the same. Yeah. I mean, not that incredible. Like I just, stopped. I mean, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> you weren't barking like a dog. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I can't play a musical instrument or anything like that. So yeah. uh, that's how come. Like I just focused on just enjoying the small things in life that a lot of people miss, like eating a bowl of cereal or actually being able to use chopsticks. Like, these are things I'm just like so stoked that I can do again. Yeah. And you just take it for granted. Like that was one of my videos on TikTok. Like I just, I hadn't eaten a bowl of cereal, like from an actual bowl in seven years. So that was, I'd always said that was the first thing I wanted to do after I got out of surgery. And the person I was with, they, they reminded me of it. I'm like, let's go, let's, let's record this. Let's do, let's see how it works. Wow. And I mean, the, the cereal went into my mouth and it didn't go on the wall behind me. So it was a win. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I got nutrition in my mouth. Wow. That was, you know, I actually saw that video, but I didn't realize it had that much meaning behind it. And I love these interviews because literally I'm reminded, like I'm holding a pen right now. Um, it's almost like my little stress. Like I just turn it around and around in my hand while I'm doing these interviews. And I'm like, I couldn't do that if I had Parkinson, you know, like just small yeah. things. We're so, we take so many things for, for granted. Yeah. A hundred percent. That's what, that's what I just try to remember every day. Every day. And I think we could all live by that for sure. Okay. Something totally off the topic, but so you like climb mountains? I I will be here soon. Um, I actually just finished a 3000 foot uh, climb this past weekend for training. You say that um, like, that's no big deal. Like you're just oh, so you're nonchalant. Oh no, my, my feet, my <laughs> knees, everything down here, it, it will tell you it was very real. It was very painful. <laughs> it very um, much happened. But yeah, to, uh, to raise money and awareness for the Michael J. Fox Foundation, um, myself and eight others, I believe half of them have been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and the other half have been impacted through a relative uh, with Parkinson's disease. We are going to attempt to summit Mount Kilimanjaro from August 7th through the 17th. So that will be next on the bucket list of stupid things for me to do. And I can't wait for it. It's going to wow. be so fun. Okay. I hope everyone takes all their medication and we know how to handle things. With 10 days of hiking a mountain sounds the worst to me, but kudos uh, to you. <laughs> it won't be that bad. It won't be that no, bad. Basically, no, no. I've, just, I've just been training for the summit day, which is going to be the worst. So I figure if I can handle the worst, I can handle the rest. Just yeah. go from there. Oh, but yeah. Um, August August 7th through the 17th, we're trying to collectively raise $90,000 for the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and I've promised to raise $10,000 myself off of it. So um, fundraising is currently going active and uh, yeah, just trying to train as much as possible and you know keep busy and keep working and yeah, all that good adulting stuff. I love that. Yeah, yeah, adulting. I used to be, I used to love hiking, but then, you know, like I became an adult and it came a lot easier. It's a lot harder now. My, like yeah. my knees hurt things I didn't know could hurt hurt after a hike yeah. so that's amazing that's really cool yeah. it, it um, is a beautiful hike I've seen yeah and the um 
Yeah, the one of the things I'm having to work through is um, with my DBS, like the more that I actually climb, the more that I hike, the more dopamine that's going into my system because physical activity does help out with your dopamine levels. Um, whether you're using a deep brain stimulator or you know, you're taking medication, you genu genuinely feel better whenever you're working out. So one thing I've had to adjust to is about halfway up the hike, like one of my legs will start, you know, just kind of not acting as it should, we'll just say, and I have to go through and kind of adjust things like left side of the brain versus right side of the brain, which side's feeling better. And then kind of go through and adjust based off that because I end up tripping over every single rock known to man, because my leg just does not want to lift up. So wow. that's one thing that we're all going to have to work on is um, gait issues. Like I currently going through and I'm tracking like the asymmetry in my walk to make sure I'm actually walking normally and I'm not leaning toward more you know, one side or more, you know, for the other one. So there's a lot of science that's going to go into it, but um, I'm hoping that the stupidity weighs, outweighs the science and I can make it to the top. That is wild. Another thing I didn't even think about. Let me ask you this. So what is, I had, um, I was talking about this interview kind of coming up with a friend and they mm -hmm. wanted me to ask you, which I thought was a great question. Why does the your remote, for lack of a better word, why does it have an on and off button? Like what instance would you turn it off? There are instances. Um, well, I mean, I, I do it mainly for awareness. It stays on all the time uh, for the most part. But there are instances where they're trying to go through and adjust your level at your neurologist meeting. So they'll turn it off. They'll turn off the one that uh, you have currently programmed to you and then they'll attach theirs. Um, so there'll be like a different remote on top of it. Um, so they'll have to like change out and there has to be an off period for that. If you're going into any type of surgery, like I've had, um, two corrective surgeries on the chest piece just to, you know, get it back into a pocket. You have to be off of the deep brain simulator for 24 hours for that. Um, and then like, if you're going through a battery change out, you're going to have to be off, you know, during that period as well. So there are certain points that you have to have it turned off. But for me, it's basically for awareness because, I mean, just looking at me, people are like, this guy, like he's perfectly normal. Like if I went and parked in a handicapped spot, you know, at Walmart, I would probably be cussed at and yelled at. I was about to say, you I could get just some bad looks. I could just turn it off and be like, yeah, you feel bad now, right? Um, but yeah, that's those are the only reasons that are really applicable. But I, I do it that way. People can kind of get... Um, inside, especially through social media on kind of like what my normal day looks like and, you know, kind of the things that people really don't get to see with Parkinson's on a daily basis, unless you're around them. Interesting. So does it charge? You were talking about, you know, a, another battery pack, like a surgery type thing. Do you have to have surgery to get a brand new battery? How does that work? There, there are multiple types of batteries, surprisingly. Um, there are the rechargeable ones that typically you have to have like you have to take like 20 minutes, 30 minutes to an hour a day and recharge, like actually have like that wire that was around my neck, basically just have that like around you and it recha recharges the battery for you. You just stick and those your fingers in a socket. Yeah, exactly. You just charge yourself up. Yeah, that's what I do. I go to a Tesla <laughs> charging station at Target and <laughs> I just plug myself right up. I have a tattoo <laughs> for it and just plugs right in. Wouldn't that be so cool though? <laughs> Um, so they have the rechargeable ones, but the one I have, it's a five year. So, um, typically just based off of how much juice you're using out of it, it can last anywhere from five to 10 years. And right now it's looking like mine's going to hold off in about seven to eight years. And then I'll have to go in and have it replaced. Okay. And is that a big deal or is it just like outpatient? You go in, get it swapped, come out. Yeah, pretty much outpatient. Like there's, I mean, they keep the same like surgery scar. So they're just going through the same scar, pop it out. They leave all of the lead wires yeah. um, in. So they take care of all of it that way. That is incredible. Like that's so cool. Yeah. You're kind of like the bionic man. I am. I try to be. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my roommate. Oh, hey, roommate. Um, Okay, so we kind of talked about this a little bit, but what are some pros and cons of having this device? So if somebody, let's say somebody might be debating getting one for a loved one or looking into it, what are a couple things you would say, absolutely love it, maybe a couple things that you'd say, this is definitely a con of it? Absolutely love it. I'm not having to take medication. Oh, um, yeah. I do feel like I have more freedom whenever it comes to just how I operate throughout the day. Like I don't have to worry about stopping, you know, three times a day to take any type of pill. I don't have to worry about, um, 
you know, is the medication going to have some side effect that's going to cause me not to be able to drive in the morning? It's very consistent in how I'm going to be. And if there is something that um, isn't quite right in the morning, like if I wake up and like my legs are feeling really heavy or I'm having a lot of um, cramps in my legs and I can adjust my PBS and within 30 minutes, like I'm pretty much back to normal. I'm getting, you know, getting back into things and I can actually operate after that. Whereas if I'm taking medication, it's pretty much just shot day. Um, so that's a huge bonus for me. One of the trepidations that I do have with it is, um, of course, any type of surgery, you don't know how your body's going to react. There's a lot of people that have um, infections in their brains, and that causes like the doctors to have to go back in and take everything back out. So there always is that risk. Um, and then surgery is just not for everybody. Um, so at some points, you know, it's just, it's really a risk versus reward on your own personal level. And for me wanting to maintain my activity level and having 30 years, I'm still having to navigate in the workforce. Um, it was just kind of a no brainer for me to do it. Yeah. I want to give you a gold star for using the word trepidatious <laughs> in a podcast. I, th <laughs> I think out of all my podcasts, you're the first one to do that. So gold star for that. Yes. Take yes. It. Yes. Okay. So something we talked about before we hopped on here, which I would love to address more because this is something I feel like my listeners talk about a lot or message a lot. So something that Justin has, gosh, I guess you're dealing with now is you're still in the workforce. I mean, you're still yep. very young and there's not full-time disability or any of that loan forgiveness. And so you're kind of in the boat as if you're a healthy 30-something-year-old guy. So let's, let's hop out into that a little bit. Like, that's incredibly interesting to me as well. Yeah, it's just, it's one of the social dynamics that people often don't think about. And it's, it's mind-numbing to some extent that um, it really takes so much effort to get people to pay attention to it. And it's that, uh, you know, someone in my condition... I've got 30 years that I still have to worry about working. Um, I want to have a family. I want to, you know, continue to raise my two fat cats and the one that's not so fat right now. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've got a lot, I've got a lot of things that I want to do. I want to, you know, climb other mountains besides Kilimanjaro. Um, but one of the social aspects that oftentimes does not get brought up, you know, locally, nationally, um, whether it be just in general conversation with somebody that you're talking to or whenever it comes to legislation in uh, Washington or, you know, throughout the world, is that the individuals that are diagnosed with young onset diseases are anticipated to either continue to work through that or they are forced to go on disability and essentially, you know, cut off their lives. Um, you know, for lack of a better phrasing for it. I mean, I threw out a gold star word, you know, earlier, but I can't think of one for this. <laughs> um, it's just, we're, we're expected to either be poor just to put it out there or to work through it, to just knuckle under and keep working. And it's, it's a sad, it's a sad thing that people, you know, haven't realized that. And there are many things that I feel like our government can do, such as providing that, um, providing any type of like loan assistance that would typically go with um, full-time disability to younger people. That way they can not have to worry about making payments versus, you know, putting money into a retirement fund, because I have to be honest with myself. I have to be honest with, you know, any, you know, anybody that's in my life, I have to be honest with my partners. I've got, I've got a timeline that I have to work off of. Um, and the last thing you want to do whenever you're being put on that timeline of operability for your own body is to have to worry about, you know, am, am I going to have enough money to actually be able to live whenever I hit 50, 60 years old, whenever I can't be in the workforce as I want to be anymore. So th there, there's a lot of changes that I hope to be made. And that's the reason I do the awareness. That's the reason I try to speak my truth as eloquently and as, um, you know, as often as I possibly can, because I do feel that it's very important that, you know, we kind of take a look at that as a society on how individuals with disability are treated on a holistic uh, standpoint, rather than just, well, you know, 65 plus, then they can have, you know, they can have what they need at that point. But, you know, what are we going to do with all these people that are getting diagnosed younger and younger and younger every year? I believe the last statistic that I looked at for Parkinson's alone was that the average year for somebody being diagnosed has dropped by five years over the past 10 so there's 
there are systematic issues. More people are either becoming aware that there are problems in their own party and they're going out and seeking that. And that's fantastic. But we have to make accommodations for that as a society or there's going to be a lot of people that are really hurt and out of place. Um, I'm lucky. I'm a lucky one. I get to work remote. I've advocated for myself to you know, be able to continue to do that. And I will continue to do that. But a lot of people don't have that option. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm ashamed to say it's something I feel like I wouldn't even think about if you didn't say, you know, when you told me you were 31 when you got diagnosed and, you know, you showed signs five, 10 years before that, my mind would never think that. And it's, you know, you park in a handicapped yeah. spot and I'm like, yeah, right. You're only 30 something years old. Society has taught us. It's almost like it's ingrained in our brain that unless you have gray hair and a walker, nothing's wrong with you, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, um yeah. And another reason I had these podcasts, like I said earlier, is just to let people know they're not alone and not everything is visible per se. Yeah. yeah so funny I, enough, my, my neurologist will not give me a handicap tag. What? I, I, I asked for one at one point. He's like, are you still doing that half marathon in January? And I'm like, yeah, well, you're not getting one then. <laughs> like, okay. You're Touché. like, what do I have to go through? <laughs> give me that I, I sticker. Have I will happily park at the end of any parking lot just because I can. That um, isn't that true. Listen, everyone listening that steals a handicap spot and you're perfectly able, I hope today you leave and you say, I'm so glad I can park at the end of the parking lot and walk to the store. Okay. And if we're going to go on that, I have another thing to bring up with Give everybody. Let's do it. Put your car, put your cart back in the cart caddy, please. Can please I get an amen? Oh, absolutely. And I fully believe that, um, and you know, some people could get mad at this, but I don't fully believe that there is actually a successful person that does not put the card back. So just saying, if you want to, if you want to be successful, it's the attention to detail, make sure you put your card back. If I can do it, you can do it. Yeah. That's me being off my soapbox now. Hey, no, I like it. I like it. That. A lot of people might come after you about that comment, but I can totally be for if he can do it, you can do it. That's for sure. I am hardcore. I get very angry. I feel like I'm not a very angry person, but the insides, they tingle a little bit when someone leaves a buggy and I am that person that will call you out. I will make you feel bad for doing that unless there's a valid reason. Yeah. Um, unless you're like, unless you're disabled, pregnant. Hundred percent understand that. I'll take the cart back for you. That's it. Um, or have small children in the car. I have. Oh God, I God. have realized you got small children. You can't leave them to take the buggy back. And I totally get that. Or pet. Yes. Or pet. Or pet. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't yeah. leave them too long. If you're if you're alone in your car, you better put it back. That's it. This is a threat. <laughs> this is a threat. Okay. So speaking of that, now that we've got all worked up, what does relaxing look like for Justin? So what does self care look like for you? I always like to ask my guests that. Okay, so I will get on another soapbox here. Self-care for me is making sure I am talking to my therapist, making sure I have that. And I, I want to be very aware with uh, the mental health aspect of Parkinson's. Um, you know, talk to the therapist, find somebody that you can completely trust with your entire story, with exactly how you are feeling and narrate that to them. Get an anxiety notebook, get a regular notebook you know, write out how you're feeling, write out, you know, what your brain is telling you versus what's going on in real life. Like there are so many things that we can do to take advantage of our own mental health that will help us more in the long term. The happier you are, the more dopamine that comes out, the more dopamine you have, the better you feel. That also wants you to get, you know, getting more exercise. So it all just kind of ties in together. Um, so I make sure I keep up frequently with my uh, therapist, make sure he's, you know, completely on top of everything that I'm going through. And I have that sounding board for myself. Um, make sure that people that are in your life are there for the right reasons. Um, my partner, she is absolutely fantastic at, you know, just keeping me in check, making sure she is at sounding board whenever I can't get to see my therapist. Um, and uh, yeah, outside of that, I read a lot now. I journal a lot, play video games from time to time since my hands are you know nice and operable now. And I've actually... Um, over the past few years, I've stepped up my cooking game quite a bit. So uh, I try to um, apply for Master Chef every single year. So hey, casting if you're no kidding, if you're watching. I'd love to be on Master Chef. Um, so yeah, I I try to cook as much as possible because that's another thing that was taken away from me for so long. 
Um, I just started learning how to cook in college and then I couldn't anymore. So now that I can actually, you know, cook and not have it be a bloody mess. Absolutely. I'm trying, I'm trying to cook it, trying to cook and bake as much as I possibly Keep can. All your fingers. Two notes on that. One, Master Chef's my favorite show ever. Let's just be honest. Two, if any producers listening to this show, I might pass out because that means we've both made it and that's really exciting. <laughs> hey, as long you, as one, as long yeah, one of us makes it now. Literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally, if you get called on the show because of this podcast, just give me a little shout out. Give me wear my t shirt on the TV show. That's what we'll do. Perfect. That'll be it. That'll be a fair so yeah, trade. So yeah, Gordon Ramsay, give us a call. We, we want to talk to you. That that next level chef, next level chef is top notch too. By the way, oh, isn't it? Oh, it's so good. I <laughs> those are my favorite. I love all cooking shows. I can honestly say I don't think I'd be a good candidate to be on the show because it would be a bloody mess. But uh, I love watching it for sure. <laughs> that would be so cool. Your story would be so neat to be on there. Seriously, um, it would be much better than the other people that try to give like their sad you know, sob story that make you want to care about them. I feel like yours is like truthful and heartfelt. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not dedicating it. You're to not like, faking it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's, all about, it's all about story, but seriously, Gordon. Yeah. Yeah. But really, <laughs> but really, I love it so much. Okay. One more question about Parkinson's that came sure. up. Did anybody in your family have it? Was it hereditary yeah. genetic? Nothing. Um, they, they originally thought that it could be hereditary because, um, I would say it's about 40 to 45% of people that are diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's. There's some type of um, gene mutation that often runs in your family. So it can be hereditary more times than not whenever it's young onset. But I went through all of the um, genetic studies and they weren't able to find any of the traditional markers for it. So um, they, for me, it's idiopathic. They, they don't have a cause for it, but it's there. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. And they, 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 wouldn't have, they wouldn't have found it without um, the DAT scan that I had to go through in Nashville, which basically is a scan that um, measures the dopamine level in your brain. And they went through and saw the asymmetry in the dopamine levels in my brain. And they're like, yeah, you see how like on the right side of your brain, the dopamine level, like it's, it's shaped like a peanut, essentially. You see how it's kind of like dipping down in this area. And I'm like, yeah, they're like, you have a, you have a tremor in your left hand, don't you? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I get you now. Some smart people right there. Yeah. Yeah. So they were able to like equate everything back and they're like, yeah, and I bet you probably have like a small tremor in your right foot. And like they had it all mapped out. Just, well, wow. Okay. All I'm hearing from this is I actually have a brain. Cool. Yeah, right. And I maybe don't like peanuts anymore. Since my no, brain, like, the dopamine, <laughs> my dopamine levels look like one. Um, <laughs> Justin, thank you so so much for joining us. I feel like we could be in here for hours. I feel like I could ask so so many questions. We may have to break this up into like four pieces and just keep. Oh talking yeah, let's forever. do it. Let's do it. I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll send you some video from uh, from Kilimanjaro too. Oh, and, yeah, absolutely. We, we can run, we can run it back whenever. We can run it back anytime. I'd love to. Oh my gosh. Okay. All jokes aside, would you come back on after your hike? If, if I make it, absolutely. <laughs> if you're still alive, let's do it. We're making a pact right now. Okay, everybody. If you want to hear the rest of this, we're going to do a few extra questions per usual with every guest on my Patreon. If you want to hear those, go to patreon.com slash Townsend Team Music. If not, we are signing off. Justin, thank you so, so much. It's thank been a you. pleasure. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right, everybody. We will see you next week. If you'd like to hear the rest of this interview, visit patreon.com slash Townsend Team Music. And don't forget, you can also watch the interviews on our YouTube channel at Townsend Team Music YouTube. Okay, guys, if you're in the market to buy or sell, I have the perfect company for you. Clark & Co. Realty is located in the Benton, Bryant, Arkansas area. But they're able to serve you no matter where you're located in the state. They've streamlined the process of buying or selling a home to make it so much easier. They have a team of industry experts that make sure you have access from anything you can think of. I'm talking from local home inspectors to painters to gardeners and so much more just to provide you with the best service possible. They're dedicated to providing the most up-to-date market data in the area. And I think the coolest part is if you go on their website, you can use their easy to use fast property search. You can even create a custom market report to see what's active, under contract, and sold in your neighborhood. 
Their team is made up of caring, knowledgeable professionals that work around the clock to help you with the process of buying and selling your home. So again, if you're in the market to buy or sell, Clark & Co Realty is definitely the company for you. Tell them Townsend sent you. Let's be honest. I think we could all use somebody to talk to every now and then. Healing Path Counseling in Conway, Arkansas is 100% my go-to when it comes to therapy. Wendy Blackwood has more credentials than letters in the alphabet. She's won awards for her outstanding services and has a whole page of board memberships. Basically, she knows what she's doing. She works hard to help equip you with the tools needed to live your best life. She even offers a variety of services including, but not limited to, cognitive behavioral therapy, technology assisted counseling, relationship counseling, and EMDR. Trust me, I know therapy can be intimidating at first, but let me assure you, Wendy does her best to make you comfortable and find the best solutions and plans for you. Trust me, don't wait to make the call. Give Wendy Blackwood at Healing Path Counseling a call today. Get started on the best version of you.